London, by William Blake, was written in 1794 and appeared in the experience section of the collection Songs of Innocence and Experience, showing the two contrary states of the human soul. Blake had a dual world view. There was the unfallen world, or innocence, and the fallen world, or experience. He saw childhood as a state of protected innocence, which was, nevertheless, vulnerable to the fallen world, embodied in the industrialization that had been kick-started by the Industrial Revolution, the political oppression of the state, and the moral corruption of the church. 1794 was a time of great political unrest and turmoil across Europe. The French Revolution had begun only five years previously, where, amidst much bloodshed, the monarchy had been overthrown. During the Reign of Terror, at the time the poem was written, as many as 40,000 prisoners, amongst them the King and Queen of France, were either executed or died in jail. At the same time, France, under Napoleon Bonaparte, had declared war on Britain and the Netherlands in an effort to topple their monarchies, and Britain would remain at war for the next 20 or so years. The poem details an imaginary walk through the streets of London, where Blake describes the sights and sounds that he sees and hears to create a bleak portrait of a city whose citizens are trapped in a self-perpetuating cycle of exploitation and oppression. The poem consists of four stanzas, each of which is a quatrain. It has a simple rhyme scheme with an A-B-A-B -A -B pattern. All rhymes are single or masculine, where the rhyme is on the final stressed syllable of the line, and this does not falter. What is interesting to note is that Blake overwhelmingly uses rhymes that have long vowel sounds, such as E, O, Ear, I, Or and Er, and in stanzas two and four uses the same ear sound, all of which enhances the heavy, almost ponderous feel of the poem. The rhythm, however, does undergo some variation throughout. The poem begins in iambic tetrameter, didum, 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 didum. But there are lines where this shifts to a trochaic rhythm, dumdi, where the final trochee is truncated to leave a stressed syllable at the end of the line, dum di dum di dum di dum This type of line would be described as trochaic tetrameter catalectic. Catalectic just means that a syllable has been removed. The effect that this mixed metre has is that it adds to the sense of disharmony that Blake sees all around him. The poem is written in the first person, I, and the present tense, e.g. wander rather than wandered, which gives the poem a personal tone as well as a sense of immediacy. This is happening in Blake's here and now, and he is distressed by what he sees. The language, as in much of Blake's poetry, is simple and direct. He also makes use of a narrow range of vocabulary, with a number of words repeated, such as chartered, marks, cry, hear and infant. In the same way that he felt that people were confined by poverty and oppressive policies, so is the language of the poem confined. Three of the four stanzas also concern hearing and sound, the effect of which is the creation of a chorus of discordant and melancholy voices, which provides the city with a disconcerting soundtrack. The title is a simple one. The one word, London, covers a large area and hints at a wide-ranging view of a city. It is, however, just one view of the city, that of its underbelly. For Blake, London is the grimy streets where people, trapped in a cycle of poverty from birth to death, are forced into labour, young boys as child chimney sweeps, young girls as prostitutes and young men as soldiers in the battle to shore up a monarchy whose very existence is under threat. Blake, as a romantic poet, strongly rebelled against a society for which industrialisation and a desire for order and control were the dominant forces. 
London, as the capital city, is the centre of what he sees as the spiritual and moral degradation of the country, the condition of which will take over if nothing is done to change it for the better. The poem begins with the speaker describing how he wanders through each chartered street near where the chartered Thames does flow. The word wander suggests aimlessness and lack of purpose. The repetition of the adjective chartered emphasises the fact that everything is owned, mapped out and subject to government control. Even the mighty River Thames, a natural and elemental force, is controlled. The juxtaposition of the verb wander, implying some element of freedom with the adjective chartered, suggests some kind of rebellion on the part of the speaker, even if only at a minimal level. For a romantic poet, such as Blake, who was all about freedom and imagination, this sense of confinement would have been anathema, and his use of rhythm, repetition and alliteration evoke the spiritual oppression that he feels. The final two lines of the stanza are made heavy by the alliteration of meat with mark and marks, the alliteration of weakness and woe, and the antinaclysis of mark and marks, where the same word is repeated but used in a different way. In line three, mark is used to mean notice or observe, whilst in line four, Blake uses it to mean signs. Everywhere he looks, he sees people who are worn down by the poverty and oppression they endure, and this, he claims, is metaphorically written all over their faces. Note that line four is the first time that Blake uses trachaic tetrameter catalectic. The stressed syllable falls on each of the key words in the line, which further serves to emphasise the people's pain and suffering. In the second stanza, Blake returns to iambic tetrameter, the regular rhythm of which is enhanced by his use of anaphora, where a word or phrase is repeated at the beginning of subsequent clauses. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every ban. These two techniques together, creating a monotonous rhythm from which there is no respite, evoke his feeling that this problem is endemic and relentless. He is surrounded by it everywhere. What is most dispiriting is that he can hear it in every infant's cry of fear. The youngest generation, often seen as a symbol of hope for the future, is just as cursed. The phrase, in every ban, alludes to the oppressive regime under which ordinary people are living. One of the most striking images in the poem occurs in line 8, with the metaphor, the mind-forged manacles I hear. Manacles are metal bands, linked with a chain, which are placed around someone's wrists and ankles to keep them prisoner. These manacles are not real, though, as they are forged or created in the mind. The people are not physically confined, they are free to move about. They are instead oppressed by industrialization, which forces them to work 12 hour days, and by poverty, a perpetual state in which they are kept due to the pittance that they receive as wages. They are also oppressed by a state which does not allow them freedom of political choice. The clanking that the poet imagines he hears is evoked by the quality of their voices. Note that every line in this stanza is end-stopped. This, along with the caesura in the middle of the third line, gives the stanza a stilted and very constrained feel, which echoes the constraints he feels there are upon the people he is describing. The third stanza alludes in greater detail to those who suffer at the hands of the ruling classes i.e. the church and the monarchy. The chimney sweepers are children, sometimes as young as four, who after effectively being sold into slavery by their poverty-stricken parents, are forced up narrow chimneys by their cold-hearted masters to remove the accumulation of soot. They often suffered from physical defamations because they were forced into unnatural positions before their bones had finished developing, and their life expectancy was not much beyond middle age due to lung disease and cancer. The linking of these child slaves with the blackening church suggests that Blake holds the church responsible for standing by and doing nothing to stop it. 
the adjective blackening works on a metaphorical as well as a literal level. Literally, the church is blackened by the polluting smog from the factory and domestic chimneys. Metaphorically, it is blackened by what Blake saw as its moral corruption. The soldiers know better off either. Forced to fight a war, they are hapless or unfortunate, and their sighs or their sounds of sadness and despair run in blood down palace walls. Blood is being shed to protect the interests of the monarchy and the aristocracy, who hide behind the safety of the walls, and Blake makes no bones about who he thinks is to blame. Note the sibilance in these lines, and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls, which evokes the sound of the sigh. The final stanza is the most dramatic, and provides an apocalyptic vision of what the future holds for humankind if nothing changes. The first line, but most through midnight streets I hear, indicates, as if what he has already described isn't bad enough, that this is what Blake sees as both most prevalent and most shocking. The word midnight here has a double meaning. Not only does Blake literally mean the streets that he mentally wanders through in the dead of night, he metaphorically means the streets which are the darkest in terms of their moral condition. The youthful harlots, to whom he refers, are child prostitutes, girls forced into selling their bodies at a young age because they have no other means of making a living. One consequence of this is that they are mothers before their time and are unable to take care of their unwelcome newborn infants adequately. Instead of being soothed and lulled to sleep, these unfortunate babies are sworn at and cursed when they cry. The violence of this is conveyed by Blake's choice of the onomatopoeically plosive blasts, the force of which is communicated by both the meaning of the word and the way in which it is articulated. Note the use of enjambment, which means that the first three lines are read without pause. This enhances the sense of continuity as the curse of oppression is passed from one generation to the next. The final line is prophetic in the way it links using oxymoron, marriage, which is a symbol of new life, with the image of the hearse, which symbolises death. Rather than a horse and carriage to transport the newlyweds away from the church, it is a hearse which conveys their corpses in their coffins towards their graves in the churchyard. Marriage means death for Blake. But why? And how are the youthful harlots to blame? He says that they blight with plagues the marriage hearse. Blight means to damage or to spoil, and plagues refers to disease. The vast majority of prostitutes at this time would have been infected with venereal diseases such as syphilis, which they would have passed on to their clients, who in turn would have passed them on to their wives and to their babies, if the wives were also pregnant. Note the plosive alliteration of blasts and blights and the quasi-alliterative plagues, the pl sound also being plosive, which communicates Blake's horror and despair at the harming of future generations. His image of contemporary London and his vision of the future are disturbing and bleak. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos on English language topics and exam techniques and English literature texts.